the monk, one of the third least placed classes in the game, and one I think that a lot of people should be really taking a look at. It's a lot of fun, has a lot of diversity. In this video today, we're going to be going out, going through how to build out your monk. Now, this can be your main character. You can respec any of the existing characters, any of your existing companions into being a monk, or choose a generic hireling from Withers and make them be a monk, whichever you choose. What we're going to do is take a look at how this is done from character creation then take a look at what the future of the monk looks like after level one talk a little bit about subclasses as well as some multi-class options you can jump ahead to any part of this video that interests you the most using the chapters in both the timeline and the description also don't forget to check me out on twitch where i do stream Baldur's gate 3 and a ton of other games but let's get started here on how to build your monk out in Baldur's Gate 3. Loading into the game, let's start our conversation off about race. Now, this is a single player role playing game. So don't worry about min maxing. Choose the race that you best like the look of and you want to role play as. That's what I will tell you. We're going to go through some options that maybe are per a little bit better than the rest because of certain things here and there, but there really is no true best race to choose. Choose the one that you want because as you can see, they all have the same exact ability scores of eight across the board and you add plus two or plus one to any one of these. So that makes the race um, have a little bit of a bonus in those, in those locations, but it is um, not dependent upon the race. There is one feature though I want to talk about before we dive into certain races, and it's the fact that you as a monk get this right here. You either attack with your fists or a monk weapon, and a monk weapon are those with which the monk has proficiency. So any weapon you have proficiency with, you start with simple weapons and short sword proficiency, that counts as a monk weapon for you. So any weapon you get proficiency. So some races give you proficiency in certain uh, weapons. Take, for example, the drow will get uh, proficiency in rapier. So that becomes a monk weapon for you. The only stipulation is it cannot be two-handed or heavy. So a great sword falls into both of those categories. So you cannot use it as a monk weapon. So kind of keep those things in mind when you are selecting your race because it does add options for you to use as monk weapons go. Don't think you have to fight with your hands. So we're going to talk about tieflings first, because this is the one that I've personally chosen. This, this is the monk that I play in my game. I made him look exactly the way I, I'm playing my character. And the sub race I've gone with is Mephistopheles, because I like the cantrip of mage hands. At level 3, I get burning hands, which I like. Level 5, I get flame blade, which is whatever. But I would personally stick steer away from the Zariel tieflings and I don't want to discourage you only reason I'm saying it is because they get a spell um, called searing smite and another one called branding smite and they're based off of a melee weapon they only can be used with melee weapon in hand so if you're not using monk weapons you want to use your hands the benefits of the Zariel tiefling you just don't get to take advantage of outside of thaumaturgy and Asmodi uh, Asmodeus Asmodeus tieflings the, the, the lord of the nine hells um this is going to give you access to produce flame right here, which is nice. But then you also get hellish rebuke, which is a really cool damage capability. And then darkness, um, which you will get if you go shadow monk. But both of those are really good. Um, a good option here too is drow. And the reason I like drow is because you're going to get rapier, short sword, and hand crossbow, which are all lovely because they will then be considered monk weapons. Uh, drows also will get granted access to a skill proficiency of perception. So they naturally get a plus two or well, whatever your proficiency bonus. Remember, your proficiency bonus, as stated right here, will increase as you level up. So don't worry about it being low to begin with. It'll, it'll scale with your level. So they may naturally get a, uh, a proficiency to perception, which is pretty nice. It, it, it is a nice little ditty to have. And then they get access to Fairy Fire and Darkness cantrips at levels 3 and 5, as well as having um, a Superior Dark Vision and Fey Ancestry, making it so they cannot be charmed as easily. I do quite like that as well. If you're going into the small route, Halflings are actually very good because they have this ability called Lucky. When you roll a 1 for an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you can reroll the die and must use the new roll. So if you want to go kind of like a little tiny uh, creature that's punching its way through everything, they're very, very good at it. And Lightfoot Halflings also get an advantage on stealth checks if you want to go the route of taking like a Shadow Monk and going very stealthy. This is a, a really good option that you can take. Conversely, too, if you want to go with something like a Dwarf, 
Dwegar are very good and very quite cool too. They get Dwegar resilience, which gives them advantage on uh, saving throws against illusions and against being charmed or paralyzed. It's always nice just to not lose control of your character. You also get these proficiencies, right? Battle axe, hand axe, light hammer, and war hammer. Remember, if it's heavy or two handed, it can't count as a monk weapon. But hand axes, battle axes, and I think light hammers all don't uh, all don't count for any of those. Uh, I think Warhammer doesn't. I think that's just versatile. Can't remember off the top of my head. But Dark Vision here and Dwarven Resilience gives them an advantage on saving throws against poison. So you get a lot of really nice, just generic uh, damage type or resistances that you wouldn't get otherwise. So consider those things. Other little uh, call outs here are the Half Orc for sure, because the Half Orc. Orc gets savage attacks when you land a critical hit with a melee weapon attack. So if you're using a monk weapon, your damage dice are tripled instead of doubled, which is really cool here. And Relentless Endurance, if you reach zero hit points, you regain one hit point instead of becoming down. So it kind of keeps you in the fight a little bit longer. But truly choose whatever you want. Uh, Gith is also a really lovely one, uh, but it's kind of weird to look this way and be a Gith. So it is entirely up to you. So let's talk now about the monk itself. And the monk is geared towards dexterity. That is the way you're really going to go, but you're also going to be using wisdom for the damage, for the difficulty rolls on certain things when it comes to, say, your stunning strike and what have you. But the monk uses either its fists or monk weapons. As you can see here from Martial Arts Dexterous Attack, attacks with monk weapons and unarmed attacks scale with your dexterity instead of your strength if your dexterity is higher. And we'll talk about uh, strength monks when we get to the ability section. Martial Arts Death Strikes, attacks with monk weapons and armor attacks deal 1 to 4 bludgeoning damage unless their normal damage is higher. So you'll always have a little base amount of damage. And bonus unarmed strike, after making an attack with a monk weapon or while unarmed, pretty much everything for monk will say monk weapon or while unarmed. It's usually feat choices that'll say one thing that's specific to like A being unarmed or whatever, something like that. But you can make another unarmed attack as a bonus action. So you can really sprinkle in a lot of bonus actions if you're playing as a monk and you go into something like a rogue thief where you're just pouring a ton of bonus actions into your character. For how that translates to you as a monk is you're just using attack after attack after bonus after bonus action. You get a lot of value out of bonus actions more so than a lot of other classes. Um, or at least you can you have options to leverage your bonus actions for damage more so than other classes. That's probably a better way to put that. So it's a very fun way to just do a ton of stuff. And I'm going to show you in actions how that comes out. Because Flurry of Blows here, punch twice in quick succession, 1d4 plus 1d4. This is a bonus action. So it allows you just to immediately dish out some more damage after you've attacked. And also, just like the Barbarian, the Monk gets unarmored defense. Naturally, our Dexterity modifier adds to our armor class, right? Everyone's armor class is 10, then the dexterity modifier adds into that and that's your new armor class. Or if you wear armor, you put it on and then you add your dexterity modifier if you can and that's your new mod your your new armor class. Well, with the monk, your dexterity is 10 plus your dexterity modifier. Remember that's whatever numbers right there that says plus x to dexterity checks plus your con your uh wisdom modifier. Barbarian its constitution. So what you really want to focus on here is dexterity and wisdom for your monk to pull as much as you can out of their unarmored defense capability here. Last class feature I want to talk about is key. And key is basically, depending upon which monk you take, it's your spell slots, it's your ability to do certain monk actions. Take this, for example, Flurry of Blows. This requires a key point. Now, key points regenerate on short rest. Um, if you go with the open hand monk, they get an ability at level 6 that allows them to regenerate key points. If you go with the elemental monk, the uh, five elements monk, you get a, an ability right away, or maybe it's actually a level 3, that allows you to regenerate key points. So this is really cool. that You're kind of like a warlock, right? In the sense that you can short rest to get your casting of capabilities back if you go with the elemental monk. Or you just short rest to get your damage capabilities back um, if you go with like open hand or shadow monk it's a really really cool capability that allows you to do a lot of fun devastating stuff and we'll talk about how that expands as we go into a, a section down the road here but i wanted to break those things down so let's now talk about our background and abilities background is going to be pretty much entirely dependent upon how you want to play your character what you have in mind for the way you want to conversationally go through things if you want to min max this option take a look at the skills that this grants you and make sure that those skills play into the ability the skills that you do not have natural proficiency with 
So if I go over here to change, uh, this is going to give us religion and insight. Well, we already got athletics, acrobatics, stealth, history, and I think religion is our other natural. Um, what's it called? Our other natural proficiency. Oh, it's insight and religion. Those are those are the ones that we get naturally. What I would tell you from a min-max perspective is probably get something that has insight and maybe a conversational option. So like a guild artist and gives you insight and persuasion. But truly go with whatever you want because these are going to give you inspiration points that you can then use to re-roll your, your certain roles without the game. And just choose whatever one you want to create the character in your head for. Like Maybe this is a noble that has decided to come into becoming a monk. A monk. Or maybe he's trained his higher, entire life as an acolyte to then go into a monk. Or, or a former soldier. Whatever it is. He's suffering from uh, some sort of situation. He becomes himself a monk. Whatever it is, take the route that you want for your character. And then we come here into our ability score. So this portion is going to be dependent upon whether you want to be a strength-based monk, meaning you use the Tavern Brothers feat that you get at level 14, or just your normal monk that would go into Dexterity and Wisdom. If you wanted to be a strength, you'd probably just swap out things as needed, but um, I can give you those stats at the end of this section. So right now what we're going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and increase our Dexterity all the way up. And then I'm going to put two points into it. Because we're a monk, we're dexterity, blah, 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 blah. We've already gone over that plenty of times, right? <laughs> and then I'm going to put all my points here into wisdom and put one point into it. This is going to give us a substantial amount of armor class. Because our armor class is going to be plus three, plus three. So we'll have 16 AC when we start the game, basically, is what that means. And you get plus one to these checks every two points beyond ten. So, as you can see, we're at 17. There are plenty of ways to get 18 or 19 right when you get a feat. So there's a lot of ways to buff this. Then we're going to bring our constitution up here to 14. Um, and depending upon if this is your main character or not, like are you using this character as your actual player character? Is it a companion? Whatever it is, I'd probably want to bring my charisma up. And the reason for that is if my charisma stays at 8, my ability checks become a minus 1. Meaning that if I want to roll Intimidation, Performance, or Persuasion, or Deception, they're all at a minus one if I don't have a proficiency into them. So, might as well have it at least just a baseline. Well, that should be zero. That's kind of funky. Weird. Yeah, that should be a zero. A little bit of buggeroo there, Mountain Dew. Yeah, I don't know why that's happening. But that should say, that should be a zero there. Because our Charisma modifier is a zero, so... That's what we would then have for any of these deception, intimidation, performance, or persuasion roles. Because we don't, if we're playing with our main character that's getting into all these conversations, we don't really want to have a natural uh, 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 weight against us, right? A natural handicap. So you might as well kind of get as much of it as you can. Let me do something like that. And there we go. We get, oh, boom. There it was. We have the persuasion and insights all crazy now. <laughs> um, and as far as skills go, Athletics can be quite good for the ability to push things away. And then from there, it's going to depend upon what kind of character you want for your monk. Are you going to go down the route of being a shadow monk? Well, then go ahead and pick up your stealth right now if you so wish. But if you're not going to be doing that, you can put it into history. You can put it into religion, whatever you want. If you did not get insight as a background, I definitely recommend putting a proficiency into insight. So it's at a plus five. Insight grants you a ton of things in the game as well as perception when it comes to just navigating uh, just the game world, conversations, all sorts of stuff. It's two of the most important skills, in my opinion, outside of the actual conversational skills. And athletics is going to help you in shoving people. You can shove them off of uh, into a precipice or whatever it so is. Now, before we move on, we're going to talk very quickly about how to do a tavern brawler stat allocation. So we're still going to use our dexterity and we're still going to use wisdom because we get bonuses to our AC with them, right? So let's go ahead and get these things up. We're going to get our strength up here as well. And we are going to put our strength here at 15 and we're going to keep it there. Because when we get Tavern Brawler, we get one point to allocate. So we're going to allocate it to strength. Because that will give us plus three to our strength checks. Tavern Brawler doubles that amount. So we get plus six. So we'll use the, the plus one stat point there. We're going to put plus two here into Dexterity. And put plus one here into Wisdom. So that we have 16 
in both. That's going to give us the plus six to our AC from Wisdom and Dex. Then we're going to put these last two points down into Constitution. This is kind of like a, a more bare bones way to run this. You can go with a little bit more points into Constitution if you're really worried and you don't want to put the, all those points into Strength up front. You could swap your Strength and Dex if you really want to, but I think you'll be just fine if you go something like this because your AC is going to be so high you will run into some issues with your 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 health but i think there's there's a lot to be said for this type of role that as soon as you hit level four and you get your tavern brawler you are going to be punching things in half it's going to be a lot of fun for your subclass options you've got three way of the open hand way of shadow and way of the four elements way of the open hand is the tried and true monk subclass it makes you more of a guy who punches people in the face way of the four elements turns you to basically a monk wizard and way of shadow is going to essentially turn you into kind of a roguish assassin style of, of monk where you use stealthing and hiding quite a bit but way of the open hand we'll talk about that first you are basically adding the ability to do a lot of really fun stuff with your bonus actions or adding a bunch of different damage layers in all these cool things so for starters you get fury of blows topple stagger and push so now your flurry of blows can push people it can knock them prone it can stagger them all sorts of cool things level six you get manifestation uh you get three of these body mind and soul and it's a toggle that you turn on a passive toggle where you do either necrotic psychic or radiant damage you add 1d4 damage to your to your unarmed attacks which is sick you also get wholeness of body so that makes it so you can regain half of your key points as well as a bonus action so it costs you an action to use but you'll get your key points you'll get your bonus action and you also get three times your monk level so if you get at level six you get 18 heal uh, uh points of health healed whenever you use it. it's really awesome but the real awesome thing for way of the open hand is the key resonation that's going to happen at level nine so what this does is you punch someone and it causes the key inside of them to resonate and it creates a condition on them and the cool thing about this is you have this as an action. You also have it as a bonus action. So you can punch people as action and punch them again as a bonus. But then you have the ability to detonate that resonation. And when you detonate it, it allows it hits in a 17 or 5 meter radius around. And anyone who also has that same affliction blows up as well. So you basically blow up everyone with all these punches and like a five finger death punch type of thing. It's really 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 sick but that is your way of the open hand the way of the four elements like i said kind of turns you into a bit of a caster you're taking advantage of your key to now use your spells here so you can use keys to power magic that harnesses the elements these spells also trigger unarmed strike so whenever you use them you also get that so what's really nice here is that you can use these outside of being silent. So if your character silence, your whole entire party can't cast spells. Not if you are a monk that is a way of the four elements. Also, they cannot be countered from what I have experienced. Um, but you would use stuff like Fangs of the Fire Snake here. This gives you like a 20 foot ability to do some fire damage. Or you get Fist of Four Thunders, which is essentially Thunder Wave, but release a wave of thunderous force that pushes away all, all creatures. So you do get some spells that are kind of a one to one from the wizard or any of the other categories that would have it. But you also get stuff like this Shaping of the Ice, create a climbable ice cube, or Water Whip, possibly pulls the target towards you or knocks it prone. So a lot of really cool, fun manipulation things. Then which since you unlock this at level three, every three levels after that, you're going to get either some sort of monk ability, or a way of four elements ability or more spells. So at level six, you get more spells. Level 11, you get more spells. Uh, and level nine, you get improved elemental casting. So several, several of your four elemental spells deal an additional dice of damage. And like stuff like Clench of the North Wind can hold on an additional creature. And basically Infernal fires an additional ray, stuff like that. It's, it's basically a heat ray spell. But they also get this ability, Harmony of Fire and Water. While not in combat, regain half of your key points rounded down. So you can kind of keep yourself constantly in motion with your key points, but also you can just short rest to get your key points back. I, I really like Way of the Four Elements. It's my favorite monk personally, and I think it's got a lot of really fun applications. If you wanted to be a stealther, then Way of the Shadow is for you. You're basically going to be playing as a rogue, but a monk. And let it be known too that... Uh, my good buddy Remortis has a great video breaking down a monk 
rogue multi-class which i'll link in the in the uh, description below go check him out he has got tons of really amazing videos for cool multi-class combinations and breakdowns but for the way of shadow here you get shadow arts hide so now you get as a bonus action the ability to go hidden and if you multi-class into a rogue then you get the ability to do stealth attacks with this which is really really nice you could go three monk one rogue and you immediately can now do uh, stealth attacks with your uh, shadow arts hide but you get pass without a trace here call forth the veil of shadows and silence that and silence that gives you and all nearby companions a plus 10 bonus to stealth check and that's an until long rest so you just have this on it's really nice darkness blinds things for you dark vision so if you're a human you didn't have dark vision we now have it uh, shadow arts silence so you can silence things and you also get minor illusion here and this progresses out to level 5 where you get Cloak of Shadows, which basically is an invisible. Then at level 6, though, you get a really fun ability with uh, the Way of Shadow that is called Shadow Step. It's basically like Misty Step, which allows you to teleport to a location. But once you do, you have advantage on your next melee attack roll, which is really cool. The real big heavy hitters for this class come out at level 11, which is Shadow Strike, which allows you to teleport and then do damage plus psychic damage. The problem I find with it is, though, that you need to kind of spice the way of Shadow up by going into some of the the rogue multi-class, in my opinion, to really get a lot out of this kit. And that's a level 11 ability. So you would basically only be able to take level 1 rogue and level 11 monk to get that online. Uh, I'm not trying to, to shit on way of Shadow. It just has a very specific play style. And if you want to be kind of a stealthy alpha striker, way of Shadow is definitely going to be for you. For our feat selection, we can really go with a lot of different things here. You can go with something like Ability Improvement to just get your Dexterity up to 19. And then maybe down the line, you go with something like Athlete to get an additional point into Dexterity if you so wish. Athlete's nice too because when you're prone, setting up uses significantly less movement and your jumps distance also increases by 50%. But those two can work really well together. There are a lot of ways to get what is called a half feat. So imp Improved Ability Score gives you two Ability Points. Athlete gives you one ability point, so it's considered like a half ability score feat. Uh, but some of the big ones too that you can really take a look at are mobile. This allows you to get increased movement speed and difficult terrain doesn't slow you down when you dash. And if you move after making a melee attack, you don't provoke opportunity attacks. Remember, opportunity attacks are whenever someone moves outside of that range of engagement with you, uh, they would get an opportunity attack against you. So that's quite nice. You get that speed increase. You get you don't provoke those uh, uh, opportunity attacks, and then you get evade uh, difficult terrain, like I was saying there. Mage Slayer can also be pretty good here too, so that you get an advantage of when you're trying to deal with mages. So you have an advantage on saving throws against spells cast by creatures within five feet of you, and you can use a reaction to make an attack against an enemy after it casts a spell within five feet of you. Also, enemies you, you hit have disadvantage when making saving throws to maintain their concentration. So if an enemy has a buff up like Bless, and you punch them, now they have a chance to actually just reduce that or get rid of that entirely, depending on what it is, what they're playing as, so on and so forth. If you're playing as a monk of four elements, stuff like Warcaster is really good here. You have an advantage on saving throws to maintain your own concentration, and you can use Reaction of Shocking Grasp to shock someone once they move out of combat with you. Spell Snapper is also good just to help you get critical hits with your spells, and also it grants you additional cantrips, which is just nice to have, just an additional bit of damage there. <clears throat> I quite like it. Um, I didn't mean to click that, sorry. Uh, but you can do other stuff like Elemental Adept as well if you are going with the Monk of Four Elements to do additional damage with a specific type of uh, damage. So like take for example here, Fire. You s spells you cast ignore resistance to damage, to fire damage. In addition, when you deal fire damage with a spell, you cannot roll a one, which is always kind of nice. Stuff like Alert is also nice. You gain a plus five bonus to initiative and can't be surprised. So this allows you to go uh, first quite often um, but you have quite a few options these are just kind of a, a few to point out please end up choosing the ones that ultimately fit the type of role play you have in mind for your monk character these are just some of the ones that i really like there's a lot of things that you could be doing here like polearm master can be fun there's a lot of different ways to have a lot of different fun with different uh, abilities here don't feel like you have to be uh, push into certain ones. Lastly, there is Tavern Brawler, uh, which gives you the ability to use quite a bit of damage. So when you make an unarmed attack, use an improvised weapon, or throw something, your strength modifier is added twice to the damage and attack rolls. Remember we talked about uh, building out a Tavern Brawler in the ability section. So if this was said plus three, it would now be plus six. 
so you really can get a lot of damage here and it's also a half feat so it's going to grant you an additional bit of strength if you need it when you're trying to build out your tavern brawler as you level up your monk though you'll get access to more and more things so you'll get patient defense attack rolls against you have disadvantage and you have advantage on dexterity saving throws step with the wind step of the wind dash double your movement speed jump to uh, jump no longer requires a bonus action. So this is, allows you to really cover a good amount of distance fast. On top of that, step of the wind disengage or treat this safely by disengaging. Jump no longer requires a bonus action. So you get kind of a two-in-one with both of these capabilities where you're using a bonus action and a key point to then displace yourself, disengage from combat, run up to someone and jump to something that allows you to get a little bit of distance moved. It's very, very nice. And they also get unarmored movement. So your movement speed is increased by 10 feet <clears throat> while you're not wearing armor or a shield. It's worth noting too that if you take a half elf, wood elf, or just a wood elf outright, you will be able to move very fast as a monk. Moving into level three here, we go ahead and pick up our subclass, which for this example here, I'm just gonna go ahead and grab um, uh, this guy here, way of the open hand, so I can talk about Deflect Missile. Use your reaction to reduce the damage from a ranged weapon attack by 1d10, plus your dex modifier, plus your monk level. So what that means is we would do plus 3, plus 3, plus 1d10. So we could vastly reduce the amount of damage we would take from a missile attack. If the damage reduces 0, you use a key point to deflect the missile, so... Keep those things in mind when you're using it and i'll just kind of keep pressing through here and now we get to our level four where we choose our feet um, but before we do that we also get slow fall when you fall you can use your reaction to gain resistance to falling damage which is lovely monk level five though is going to be giving us that extra attack so that whenever we do an attack with an action we now hit twice with that action which is nice well we can choose to hit twice also we get stunning strike here too this is going to be based off of our um it's going to trigger a constitution save, but I believe that constant or your wisdom helps in the difficulty class of this. So having a good wisdom is always quite nice. And then moving into level six, we're going to get even more stuff unlocked here for the monk. We're going to stop at level eight or so because then it's just kind of a little bit more flat. But we're going to get key empowered strikes. Your unarmed attacks count as magical for the purpose of overcoming enemies' resistances and immunities to magical non-magical damage. You get even further increased your unarmored movement this didn't increase it from 10 or by 10 and now 15 it's doing instead of 10 it's a 15 foot increase um you get subclass features at this level as well manifestations like i was talking about here and wholesome wholeness of body since we went with the open palm and into level seven we would get these two abilities. The big, the big one I wanted to point out here is the evasion. So when your agility, your agility lets you dodge out of the way of certain spells. When a spell or effect would deal half damage on a successful dexterity saving throw, it deals no damage if you succeed and only half damage if you fail. It's a very nice way to mitigate a lot of ranged spell damage coming your way as a monk. And stillness of mind, if you are charmed or frightened, you automatically cast stillness of mind to remove the condition here. And this is an action that removes charmed or frightened conditions. Uh, but that's that's a lot of the fun here. At level eight, we're gonna get on. Um, we're gonna get another uh, feat unlocked. Um, but from there, we're gonna start to get other things like um, deft martial arts, deft strikes, more uh, 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 subclass things, improved unarmored movement again at ten, which is gonna bring you up to twenty feet in total. Um, all plenty of other things that you're gonna get as you progress through monk. But I wanted to show you these first eight levels so you have a good concept of what's coming your way. For multi-class options, we're going to talk about the Rogue Shadow Monk first. Um, it's probably one of the better ones I can have in the back of my head. And this one, again, is the one that Remortis did a really awesome uh, video on. He called it the Shadow Ninja. And the decision here at level one is a choice for you between do you start as a monk or as a rogue? If you need a character to do all of your lock picking and all of your stealthing around early in the game, like you don't intend on bringing a rogue into your party then start as a rogue this way you're going to get access to the ability to give yourself skills with expertise so you can go with sleight of hand here which is really going to just vastly increase your capabilities um, when it comes to uh, picking open locks disarming traps whatever it is you can also go into stealth here but you can also choose a conversational uh, proficiency if you want this is not only your roguish capabilities so you can make it so hey you know what i'm even better at persuasion by going down this route of choosing my skills with expertise as a um 
as a rogue. So do whatever one makes the most sense for you in the playthrough you have in mind, but you'd want to either start with your rogue or your monk, depending upon what role you want to have for your main character or that character in your party. Keep in mind, remember, like I said plenty of times, this doesn't need to be your main character. You can have Asterion go down this route if you want to still keep him some sort of rogue-like character, but also have him jump a little bit into some monk flavoring. Start him off as a rogue, go three levels into that, then go into monk, then finish off with even more monk. Um, so if you went with rogue first, I would go three levels into rogue, then finish monk all the way through. If we're going monk first, we're going to go six levels into monk, three levels into rogue, and then finish off with uh, monk. So let's go ahead and see what that would look like a little bit down the road here. So here we are at level six. We're going to definitely pick up our key empowered strikes as well as Shadow Step. Shadow Step is just so strong and such a good ability to have. We press Accept, it's gonna bring us here into level seven, but we are not gonna choose Monk. Even though this does give us evasion, we're gonna now bounce on over to Rogue. And the goal with Rogue, and this is when you can also get your ex skills with expertise later in the game, so keep those things in mind as you're kind of going through it. It, it kind of messed with my stats, unfortunately, but it's fine, it's fine. You would take this up to Thief, where you would then um, get the ability to have more bonus actions. And the reason we're going with Thief here is because, well, bonus actions. Unfortunately, my guy won't go all the way up that high. But this is gonna give us the capability here to do a lot more functionality with our, our rogue, right? Because we already do so much stuff with bonus actions as it were. If I can just click this bonus actions button, you can see Without looking at the items, we have so all of our Steps of the Winds are in here, our Flurry of Blows is in here, our Patient Defense is in here, our Shadow Step is in here. Thief is going to grant us an additional bonus action, so we can do a lot more here, right? We can use our Cunning Action Hide and then Shadow Step all in the same turn and then follow it up with an actual punch to the face. So you have a lot of really cool things that you can do with this combination of uh, Shadow Monk and thief rogue now you can of course go assassin but i think that the thief rogue into level three is a great way to go for getting that bonus action um there's a term there's a term for it uh, uh, uh bonus action economy and then finishing off with monk getting more um improved ability scores if you need it or whatever when it comes to another feat from the monk in the last two levels you're grabbing outside of our shadow monk you have a lot of interesting multi-class options because of the way that monk weapons work, it's any weapon you have proficiency with, as long as it's not heavy or two-handed. So you can start as a fighter and spice into a monk, or go as a monk and spice into a fighter. And maybe you're going with a tavern brawler, where you do focus on having a higher strength, so that's what makes a little bit more sense for you. You can go with a monk, though, and spice into open hand, and then go over here into barbarian a little bit to pick up rage, back into rogue to go pick up your thief uh, bonus actions. You have a lot of ways to approach this. And if you go with a monk that goes for elements, you can spice into things like cleric or druid to have a little fun here. You could even go into stuff like warlock if you wanted, but I, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, the reason I said cleric and druid is because they're both wisdom-based classes like you already have with your monk. So there are fun ways to approach the multi-class for the monk. But the four elements one is one I probably would not multi-class personally. The open hand, I think, can take advantage of going into some of the other fighter capabilities. Uh, and we've already talked about how the Shadow Monk can benefit heavily from going into Thief. So hopefully this helps you out with Monk. I, in my mind, the Monk, it, it can run better pure than most classes, I think, which always can take advantage from a lot of different multi-class combinations. And if you have fun multi-class combinations, please let it be known in the comment section below. Let people know the levels and when you would pivot into certain classes to give people some fun different multi-class opportunities. At that, it brings our video here to a close. So hopefully this gives you a better idea on how to build your monk out. And I didn't go as much into equipment because, well, monk doesn't need to worry about weapons so much so, right? Even their armor, they don't really need to worry about it. But you will get a ton of Kushigo gear as you reach the end of Act 1 and the beginning of Act 2. So I would just say put that on as you acquire it. And maybe if you get access to any other non-armor, see if it kind of fits into the route you have intended for your monk. Is there, are they going to be a caster? Are they going to be an open hand monk? Are they going to be a shadow monk? Play that how you, as you see fit. You'll have plenty of hoods that give you stealth bonuses and stuff like that. But if you have any other questions, go ahead and let me know in the comments section below. Um, I'm starting to kind of slowly do these for all of the classes. So if there's 
a certain class you want to hear about, go ahead and let me know below. The next one I'll probably be doing is wizard because I did not do that for my original breakdowns. But if there's a way that you want me to approach these videos that I'm not doing now, also let me know. Any kind of feedback does help me out in making these videos provide the most information to you guys. But as always, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.